will uh, try and do is uh, uh, first thing today will be just uh, details about what we will discuss in the class. Uh, so first, let me go ahead and uh, this is the outline of today's presentation. This is the first class, and most of you are not even aware of what manufacturing is, right? So how many people have some inkling? So either what you can do is either you can type in the chat box. We want to have some communication going here. So either uh, you can uh, type in the chat box, or what you could do is you could uh, uh, use uh, unmute yourself and talk also. That's that's fine by me. Uh, it's a small class, not a very big class, so I think we should be able to handle that as well. And uh, how many people have any semblance of what manufacturing is? Like what what in your opinion, what do you think manufacturing means? Any idea? Any of uh, creating goods from uh, raw materials. Mm -hmm. So raw materials and do what with the raw materials? Uh, process them, mold them, and like. Okay. Uh, transform them into uh, raw materials for further processing or into finished goods. Okay. So either you basically do some intermediate step or produce into finished goods. So that's one uh, definition for manufacturing. So manufacturing, uh, a unit manufacturing, what you said is right. You take uh, some raw material or something and then you change something there, either shape or a property. So you do something. Most likely what you do is you provide some form of energy and then you change either the shape or the property of that of, of that thing. And that will be a unit manufacturing processes. But there is another definition of manufacturing, which is enterprise level uh, manufacturing. So anything right from the concept to the recycling of the entire thing constitutes manufacturing. So I'll give you both the both the, um, uh, the definitions of manufacturing. And uh, so I think you have some semblance. Uh, uh, so basically, I'll talk about contact details. Uh, my name is Ramesh Singh, and uh, I'll be teaching you manufacturing processes one. Uh, my office is in Machine Tools Lab. Not that it is it is uh, very helpful these days since you guys are um, online. So uh, if you happen to return back, then we would do some um, some of the projects here in the Machine Tools Lab. Uh, we'll still do the projects. We'll try to do some analysis. And if possible, somebody can help you make some small things. Uh, we will want to have a hands-on project as a part of this course. Um, if you get back in time before the semester ends, uh, we would have uh, something in the machine tools lab, which appears to be unlikely right now. But uh, usually what we do, even till the last year when the uh, semester was cut short, we had uh, student projects in the manufacturing. I'll, I'll, I'll give you some of the topics of the projects. There will be a TA to help you. Uh, and then uh, you do some projects which will be uh, which will have some credit associated with it. Uh, you can call me at seven five zero seven. You can email me uh, whenever you need to talk to me. You can either um, either have an appointment or four to five uh, Fridays. I'll uh, be available on some web platform, so you can have some discussions if you need to. And this is the class website. So class website is there. All the lecture notes will be uploaded. Of course, they will be there in the Teams files. And they will also be there in um, what do you call uh, um, uh, your uh, website, uh, your team's uh, course files. Will, it, it will also be there. You have any questions? So basically, before we go into focus and objectives, I would show you a small video just to give you some semblance of what basically manufacturing does. This is a very old video, 1938. And uh, what this does is this actually shows manufacturing of a locomotive. So let's see. Let's see that video. It's a very interesting video. I will um, let me just start this video. We'll watch for a few minutes, and then I would want you to to basically um, see what kind of processes go on in there.
it is the video audible for you folks no sir no sir no sir, no, sir. No, sir. I don't know why the video is not audible. Let me do one thing. Let me just. I think it's probably because uh, my. I'll 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 change the. Ready for stamp. Carefully. Yes, sir. Long-sided yes, twin. The which it will be secure. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Was it audible or no? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It was primarily because I had my Bluetooth on. So I'll start it again. Now for our first bit of real engine building. 
completed cylinders meet the completed main frame. Add the two outside cylinders, which have gone through exactly the same process as the inside cylinders, and the frames are ready to leave for the erecting shop. In the midst of modernity, the ancient craft of the smith still holds a place. Weight, of course, is useful as a smith, and we've no hesitation in affirming that the smith, a mighty man, is he. All manner of smaller parts are made in the smithing. Nuts and bolts in all sizes and varieties, rivets for the tens of thousands, washers, springs, and small forging. They're all part of the grist that comes to the smithy mill. Batteries of machines, each designed to do a particular job, cut and drill the various parts of the boiler, steering through the tough steel as though it were cheap, until finally they are ready to be assembled. This gigantic machine applies little more than gentle pressure to force into shape the steel wrapper plate. First in the assembly of the boiler is the joining together of the three sections of the barrel. Here you see the various parts of the boiler laid out in line. Steel wrapper plate, foundation ring, top and bottom half throat plate, fire door plate, and the barrel. The throat plate is being attached to the barrel. Some 3,500 rivet holes have to be drilled. On this tower triple drill, the boiler can be rotated, moved backwards and forwards, and the drilling head moved upwards and down. The gigantic size of the boiler can be realized from this picture. Rivet, rivet, and more rivet, adding strength to strength. 250 pounds of pressure to the square inch needs a bit of holding and hold it the boiler must. The inside copper firebox and the outer steel casing are securely held together by over 2,500 stays. The stays are screwed in and the heads riveted over. A modern engine, such as 6207, has a big appetite for steam. Hence her large grate area of 45 square feet and her high amount of tubing. First to go in is the main steam pipe through the center of which will later go the rod connecting the regulator handle to the valve. Now the smoke tubes, of which there are 112, each 19 feet 6 inches long. The 32 superheater tubes are the same length. These are screwed to the firebox tube plate. Meanwhile, things have been happening at the other end of the boiler, and some familiar objects have been finding their way onto the fire door plate. has to be conserved, and this is how it's done. Steel wrapper plate, foundation side cylinders, and the frames are ready to leave for the erecting shop. In the midst of modernity, the ancient craft of the smith still holds a place. Weight, of course, is useful as a smith, and we've no hesitation in affirming that the smith, a mighty man, is he. All manner of smaller parts are made in the smithy. Nuts and bolts in all sizes and varieties, rivets for the tens of thousands, washers, and hold it to... So I'll stop it here now. Uh, let me unshare the screen now. Okay, so I'll share the other screen where I can write.
Okay. So let me ask you one thing. What are the processes which you saw here? Can somebody name the process which they saw here? Molding, this, welding, uh, riveting. One by one. One by one. Uh, molding. Molding. What do you mean by molding? Uh, the where they poured the hot metal into that thing and then broke away the sand, the okay. mold, sand mold. It's called casting. Molding uh, is a generic word, but molding typically is used for where you pressurize it. Uh, so it's probably for more for uh, uh, in, in injection molding. Uh, but yeah, you're right that that's a mold. But the process is called uh, primarily casting. Uh, at least in the metals, it is called casting. So okay. you saw casting. What else did you see? Uh, riveting. When they riveting. were fixing the two parts okay. and they riveted it. Mm -hmm. So any particular reason why they were riveting? Is there another process which you can use in place of riveting? And do you see rivets, these many rivets anymore in um, in in general world now? To joint place, what what is the process you use? You have done your first year workshop, right? What do you use for uh, joining welding. processes? Welding. 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 welding, welding. So why do we? So so earlier welding processes were not there, right? So we had to use um, riveting, but now we have welding processes. So you don't need uh, riveting that much. If you see the old bridges, you remember those old uh, British era bridges, which, 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 which uh, the truss bridges, which you see um, of uh, painted with red metal oxide. How many people have seen such old bridges with, with like red metal oxide paint, which, uh, which is like total metallic bridges, old bridges, British era bridges. Yes. Have you seen that? Nobody has seen that, is it? No, sir. You have not seen the metallic, uh, old, old school metallic bridges? None. Railway bridges, have you seen? Those railway bridges of ma made of metal? Yes. Yes, yes, sir. Yeah. How many, how many people have been to Calcutta and seen the old uh, Howrah Bridge? So, if you have not been, the old bridges, right? These bridges are all riveted. Primarily because we did not have a good joining technology. So now that we have good te joint technology, we don't need to use those many rivets. So it's welding is the, the preferred process of joining. So today, if you want to have uh, those boilers, which, which you saw, which were made for uh, uh, this locomotive, uh, unfortunately, um, today we don't use uh, steam boilers uh, for uh, at least not for locomotive purposes. But we use it for power plants and almost everything is welded now. All the pressure vessels today are welded and not riveted because welding has evolved and welding is a better process as of now. So that's that's why people use welding more than uh, riveting these days. But uh, riveting was a riveting is still used at one place, which is very, very common. Uh, can anybody tell me where the where do you see rivets these days still reasonably common? And I'll give you a hint that this is a this is a uh, actually a mode of transport. Is it ships? Ships, little bit. Aircraft. Most common the aircrafts. If you have you looked at the aircraft wings, the entire wing is riveted. The fuselage is riveted. Fuselage is the central part where you sit, the, the cylindrical cubicle tube part which you, where you sit. Those, those are riveted, primarily because A, because they're made of aluminum and you need high strength and you don't want, uh, so welding aluminum is not easy. So most of the aircrafts are riveted and riveting actually gives you long life. So riveting still is used. Of course, ships, see they use it, but uh, air, uh, aircraft still, Riveting is used quite uh, uh, quite extensively in, in aircraft, uh, in, in, in airplanes. So basically, uh, what we will uh, do in this course would be what uh, one of your colleagues was suggesting, A, molding, which is casting, right? So we'll, we'll cover casting, we'll cover joining, not riveting primarily, but we will, we'll, we'll talk more about joining processes as in welding. Deformation processes, which you see the guy, the guy was hammering the hot metal, right? 
that's one of the oldest processes which human beings uh, discovered all the swords right all the swords everything was made by forging because forging gives you high strength any ideas if i if i deform the material right especially if i do cold deformation not hot deformation cold deformation although uh, deforming cold material takes lot lot more energy than a hot material because hot material is very soft right so if you heat the material the material becomes soft and then you can deform it very easily uh so that is one way to deform it if i do cold deformation then the material becomes very very strong anybody knows why if not we'll discuss it when we when we go to deformation processes and deformation processes if you saw the video there were two kinds of deformation processes one was big chunk of metal was being deformed and if you remember there was one where you are making the boiler tubes you are bending the sheets so there is bulk deformation and sheet metal deformation so you do two kinds of deformation processes and then polymer plus processing which is primarily molding so can somebody tell me what is the what is the defining uh, connection between sorry between these uh, between casting joining and deformation processes and polymer processing Is, is is there a thread between all these? Why are you choosing these processes? And uh, can somebody tell me what other processes is uh, in in that uh, uh, video you noticed? So one was drilling. Drilling. I'll just write it down for for the sake. Drilling. What else? So one was milling. Milling. What else? Anybody? Drilling, milling. The forging was also there. Which was? What was that? Forging, there? forging. The forging I've already used here. Deformation processes is forging actually. So I'll I'll just use these processes. Let's say boring also. So I am not talking about these three processes. I'm not talking about these these three processes. Why? I'm only talking about casting. joining deformation process and so i'm talking about casting i'm talking about joining deformation processes and polymer processes polymer processing only these processes why so because probably the use for uh, manufacturing of components and the later process are, are used for further machining of the components okay so the reason is <laughs> a bigger reason is because that's how your course is uh, structured in in the manpro one we only cover mass conservation processes or mass addition processes machining is a independent course by itself which you will do in 338 so basically uh, what we will doing would be subtractive processes we will not discuss here so machining is drilling milling um, turning all these processes we will not be talking about here we'll only be talking about mass conservation where we conserve the mass or we add the mass right so that's why these are the course these are the process which you'll discuss in this in in this course and what we would do is we would do a first order mathematical description because you're an engineer right so you need to understand we are not we are not technicians right we need to understand the process how to make it better what is required if somebody you are a practicing engineer somebody tells you i have this material and i have to make this shape can you recommend what size press i need so you need to be able to have some sort of a tool with which you can analyze the process and predict what kind of uh, forces will be required and the power to drive the hydraulics or the motor system would be required right so these things you have to be able to know so i'll basically say that the first order mathematical approximations of the processes you will do and that you will do for temperature why is temperature important can somebody tell me why is temperature important in the first place for which process temperature will be important can somebody tell me that now you know that we talk about casting we talk about welding is temperature important in casting should i know the temperatures how temperatures uh, evolve while we do casting process will that be an important thing for us 
Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Why? Because we Why need to decide it? when to break the mold. Pardon? Uh, because we need to decide when to break the mold. Okay. So a lot of people agree the temperature is important. More than breaking the mold, that's one thing because we need to know how it cools down, right? We need to know what is yeah. the rate of cooling and how the temperature comes out uh, when it is at room temperature. Another bigger problem is while you are pouring it, you saw how big the casting was, right? That engine casting. Now the question is, what if the material freezes in between? Ah, uh, yeah, right. So we need to understand what kind of superheat we have to give. What is the rate of cooling? It should not uh, cool midway. Otherwise, what will happen is your entire casting will go to waste. So we need to understand what are the temperatures, what is the melting temperature, how, what kind of uh, overheat we uh, or uh, what kind of uh, um, uh, overheat we need to give to be to make sure that the temperature doesn't really go below the melting point while it is filling up. So all this analysis we should be able to do. Where will forces be important? Forces and power be important. I gave you some example, right? When I'm when I'm forging, right? I need to deform the material, right? When I deform the material, how do I estimate what kind of forces will be required? Any ideas? I'm not, I, I understand that you haven't really thought about it, but imagine I have a simple, uh, say, uh, cuboid block, right? And I'm trying to press it to deform. Tell me some idea, how do I estimate forces? If I were to estimate forces, a very, very, basic uh, idea to estimate forces. I have a cuboid piece. I want to compress it, make it flatter. Then it will depend upon its like Young's modulus and uh, that thing. OK, so let me let me let, let me just bust your bubble here. Nothing will be Young's modulus driven here because you're way above elasticity. Yes, yes. Right. Because you're plastic, def you're deforming it plastically. So you would need the plastic behavior of the material. That's very correct. You need some sort of a stress strain relationship. Unfortunately, it will not be Young's modulus. It will be a nonlinear behavior. Yes, so yes. We'll talk about it a little bit in the in the course. I understand that you haven't read that yet, but we'll de we'll develop all these correlations and we'll tell you what kind of strains would come. So if you know the stresses, if you know what kind of stresses would be required, I can basically do a stress times area and get a force estimate. I can get about the shape estimation. If I know the strain, what would be the final uh, height post uh, deformation? I can get final shape. I can also estimate in some cases what time would be required to do the process. So these are some of the things which we need when we analyze the process. And we also need to understand the capabilities and limitations of unit process. A unit process is defined by one process, right? If I have to make a train, I have to do a lot of these processes, right? I have to do casting, I'll have to do riveting, I'll have to do machining. All these individual processes are called unit process. So what we will be studying in this course will be unit process and understanding how a unit process works. What is its capability? How do we do first order mathematical approximation of the process? So we'll, we'll understand the process and we'll also understand the quality which it can give and productivity which, which it can give. Let me ask you a simple example, right? I have a, I have to make a, say, uh, maybe uh, for a lack of a better word, I have to make a piston. Let, let me just say I have to make a piston. This shape of a piston, you know, a piston is like a cylinder. Uh, it's like a, uh, a circular, uh, say, circular plate, right? With some sort of a connecting rod. Now. What kind of process I can use to make that? Can anybody tell me what kind of uh, process uh, you'll use to make a just as uh, just as uh, basically a circular uh, uh, for the lack of better a circular plate? How do you make it? How can you make it? What are the processes you have which you with which you can make that? Any ideas? So one thing that forging will be there. OK, so you can do forging. You can take a, di a, a different piece and make it. Uh, uh, actually, casting is one process. Yes, you can do casting. You can do machining. You can do forging. Right. Or let's say you can also do additive manufacturing. Nowadays, you can do 3D printing also, right? These four processes are there. If I say you have to make one piece, which one would you suggest? 
and why? So probably uh, an additive huh? manufacturing process. Which one will assist? So pro an additive manufacturing process. Yes, very good. Because I don't need anything, right? I don't need hmm. as a machine. I can print it. I can I can make a uh, one piece. I have to make twenty five pieces. What would you suggest? Low volume manufacturing. Sir, a machining process. Why machining? Uh, so because again the equipment used is probably a little more generic and does not so very it's good. low volume very manufacturing. Good. So good. I don't need to invest much. So I, I I only lose some material because I would do something machines. I lose some material as chips. But I'm able to make it without any special machinery with it. If I were to do casting, I have to do make a pattern, I have to make a mold. So if I have few hundred pieces, maybe I'll go for casting. If I have to make a million pieces, right? In that case, I don't want any waste. And I have large volume, so I can make a die, take a, take a starting piece and just forge it, right? Forging is very expensive, but if you have to make, say, hundred thousands of those or very high quantity of those, you would go with the forging process, a deformation process. So if you have to make one piece, you could go with additive. If you have to make a million piece, you go with uh, deformation processes. If you have to make a more complex piece, which is not easy to, to machine, then you will do casting. Because casting, you can get very complex shape, although you have to do some finishing operation there. So these are the things which I want you to appreciate. What are the capabilities and limitations of the processes? Right. What kind of so if I do casting, the, the roughness will be very high. It, it, it will need a finishing operation. So this is this is the limitation. So I want you to appreciate the K A, the capability, and B, the limitation of the unit processes. Because then only you can make a wise decision there. Then I also want you to understand the physical principles underlying this process. What is the what is the physics behind the process? How does this process work? Uh, so in case of, say, casting, uh, you pour the material, so there's a material flow. So you need to understand the, the, that the flow should be laminar. If it is turbulent, then there would be aspiration. So you need to understand the flow, uh, the, 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 the flow of molten material. You need to understand some solidification. Uh, you need to understand that what, how do you design the material to go smoothly so that there is no air intake and porosity is not induced. So some of the physics behind this, this process you need to understand. And all this knowledge has to be applied to process selection, part design, and quality control. So these are the objectives of the course. I gave you some idea of what, what I expect uh, you to, to get from this course. If you do this course, you should have some understanding of the unit processes, capabilities, and limitations. And you should have some understanding of the physical uh, phenomena behind this process. Okay. And we also need you to do a lot of teamwork and group projects because at the end of the day, when you go to an industry, you need to have a team of people to realize certain things. One guy cannot do much, unfortunately, at least in the manufacturing or product development, product building. You need, you need a team of people with complementary skills, right? It's not like developing an app, right? It is a product. Everybody should work together and basically create a product. So it would need... Uh, I'll actually in the end, I'll show you how a product is developed. Some of the products which are developed in our labs, I'll share with you. Okay. And of course, somebody rightly pointed out the cost. Yes. Money is the most important decision. I totally agree with you. So you have to make it cheap. Whatever you do, you have to do it cheap. And for cheap, but with good quality. Okay. So this is, uh, these are the course. So we'll, we'll have homeworks in the courses. Uh, we'll have some exams, uh, probably a couple of quizzes and homeworks. Um, I expect um, you to, to not, um, uh, it's very easy now to see because I have uh, access to all the homeworks and uh, reports and everything. So I would expect that uh, you will uh, respect the honor code and the work has to be independent. I actually, I cannot emphasize enough, it has to be independent work. Independent work because I am interested in your learning. Right, I don't, I'm not interested in your grades. Let me tell you very honestly, nobody will fail this course. Um, this, this, this doesn't apply now, although uh, for, for, for my classes, I'm actually very particular that nobody's cell phones should be out and you should not be peeing in the cell phone while I'm teaching. But unfortunately, I cannot enforce this time, this one. Probably a lot of you are using your cell phones to, to 
to get this lecture so this this one is no more valid this is for a class classroom uh, classroom uh, thing uh, assignments will be 10% of your credit quizzes will be 10% midterm will be 25% project would be 20% i would assign projects in a week or two and i'll also assign you one of the ts to help you he will help you in the sense that he will try to 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 guide you but the guide you as in like he can he he can uh, if you ask him something he will he will answer the question so the onus is on you for the project the onus is on you you can ask questions he will respond if he is not responding you can talk to me i'll i'll, I'll respond but his role is to guide you your role is to work he will not do things for you you have to do yourself but he will be able to to give you suggestions right suggestions to go forward and uh, we'll also have some sort of a weekly interaction with the with your tas so that uh, you can update him what is going on and we'll have multiple presentations we'll have one one presentation before midsem uh, and then uh, some submissions i would want you to basically give first an abstract of the project to basically help you understand what you want to do um and then uh, a mid term presentation a mid term report a final presentation in the final report so there will be five submission there will be five activities in this project which will work which will be worth 20% and all of this is to basically make sure that you keep on uh, keep engaged with the project at regular intervals i know you have a lot of courses to worry about i don't want to overload you but at the same time i want you to be uh, to be on top of it and semester exam is 35% and then total this is 100% any questions here on this uh, okay uh, the question is is the team project is is the project a group one yes it's a group project and by now i think uh, you guys have friends so i typically don't want to assign uh, groups you can do a self selected group of four you select yourself and then don't complain that this guy is not working that guy is not working you make a team Uh, knowingly who the who your who your partner who your partners are and then uh, in the end i don't want to hear any complaints about it because you have self selected those four people knowing very well how they are what they are now you have known your friends for about a year and half okay maybe this this 8 9 months uh, will not count but still uh what would you prefer would you prefer uh, self selected or you want me to 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 make because this this time it's slightly different because you may not be able to have a personal uh, connect with a lot of folks so if you want i can also do a, a fixed assignment usually i don't do usually i never i have never ever uh, assigned uh, people because i love people uh, to do self selected because that's that's that gives them some degree of comfort and uh, workability so we'll we'll have self selected in that case Okay. If you have any problems in getting matched up with somebody, look me up. I'll 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 match you up with somebody. Hello, sir. So let me just uh, we discuss this. So I'll just go over it. Uh, the actual word the manufacturing has come from manufactures, which is manus means hand, factors means made. So manufacturing is actually handmade. Unfortunately, uh, now the now now the meaning is entirely different. It's it's actually machine made rather than hand made but what manufacturing typically means is that you have raw materials and you do something to it and you comes usable product so basically either you change the shape or properties now can somebody tell me what what are the properties which you can change shape everybody understands right so you have a cylinder you make a ball out of a cylinder right or you make a free form shape by machining you can make a sine curve if you like right very complex shapes you can create now Uh, especially with machining now my question is what are the properties you can change strength strength which one strength strength, strength. strength. now can somebody define what is strength what do you mean by strength deformation pardon resistance to permanent deformation resistance to what deformation permanent deformation resistance to deformation so is it modulus ah uh, no so the e when you talk about strength right 
Physi- let's not go into to, 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 to technical technical uh, definition. Just tell me if you say A is stronger than B, what do you mean? What property? Show me. Hmm? Sir, A can tolerate uh, the situation greater no, no, as no, no, compared no, no. to B. What property? You are an engineer, Baba. The yield strength. Yield strength. Right. So, yield strength. Strength basically means yield strength, meaning you are talking about onset of plasticity. So, yield strength is one thing where it starts to deform plastically. Point. So, if I apply, say, some amount of uh, 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 force, it will result into stress and my stresses at which or if the diameter of the two or two materials are same, the stresses will also be the same for the same force. So it can take larger stresses and larger forces, right, before it deforms plastically. So that is one thing. That's one definition of strength. But that's actually uh, not an easy way to, to find this one, right? If you have a nice UTM machine, you'll be able to find it. But if you don't have a UTM, it's not able, you're not, not easy to find it. A simpler uh, definition would be ultimate tensile strength. We just keep on pulling it, pulling it, pulling it till it breaks. So strength is basically either ultimate failure of tensile strength or yielding where the onset of plasticity comes, which basically means if I unload it, it will still keep the deformed shape. Right. So that would be the strength. What is other property? Strength and what else? Any other property? Material property, which I can change. Hardness. Hardness. What does hard? What does hardness mean? Resistance to local indentation. Which one? Resistance to local indentations. Okay. So basically, your resistance to indentation, basically resistance to plastic deformation. It hard basically means you do not deform plastically, right? This is a deformation, would be hardness. Typically, hardness and strength are generally related, generally. Okay, any other, any other uh, property? Toughness, sir. Okay. Toughness, right? What is toughness? Anybody can define toughness for me? Uh, withstand load without fracturing or breaking. So toughness basically, let me just say, toughness basically means is how much energy it absorbs before it fails. So this area under the stress strain curve is toughness. Okay. If a, if a material is brittle, right, you know, it will just fail like this. So the area under the curve will be this only. If material is ductile, it will deform a lot. So if, if, if I have, say, a bumper in front of my car, what do I want? I want it to absorb a lot of energy and not fail immediately so that I get less energy impact. So toughness would be something that strains a lot. And the area under stress strain curve, which basically is energy, it takes a lot more energy, would be tough to fail. So basically sigma, if you say sigma, so this is sigma d epsilon, and this sigma d epsilon under from zero to epsilon would give you energy per unit volume. Okay, that's what is toughness. Okay. So these are the properties that you can change. So if you take a cold material, if you take a cold material, deform it, it actually becomes stronger. Hardness, you can do uh, these matasitic processes where you can do a quenching process and make it hard. Toughness, you can change the microstructure and get tough. Smaller microstructure will be generally tough. Or you can have some sort of annealing process which will uh, make it softer, but it will also make it more ductile. So if ductility increases, it will typically be tough, but it will be a function of ductility as well as your st- uh, stress both. Okay, uh, your uh, uh, yield stresses and ductility will basically govern the toughness. 
because it's under the it's the area under the stress strain curve okay so we'll stop here uh, with the material processing and then let me just finish it up and manufacturing can also be defined as a system or an enterprise so basically it's a series of integrated activities operations involving design material selection planning production quality assurance management marketing everything comes under manufacturing so if you want to it's a very complex interdependent activity that's dynamic in nature so if you want to understand right from need because if i want to make a product right i need to understand if there is indeed a need for it so i'll do a market research i'll do a market forecast i'll get a concept of the product i'll make some rough sketches make the concept of the product get a conceptual design going so this is what i want to make so before ipod uh, came into the market right what steve jobs did is there is no music system in the market if today if you bring ipod it will not fly anywhere because everybody has a cell phone which has a music system built into it right but at that point of time 20 years back in 2000 uh, that was that there was a need for that kind of a product so you get a conceptual design you will make something like this you will come up with drawings then we will do product design you will make uh, you will make the specifications for the product uh, do some design and analysis and then you will make some solid model drawings some 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 part drawings solid models uh, then we, based on the solid models you will create a bill of materials what materials will be needed then you do process planning then you do process r and d then you do actual manufacturing you need toolings jigs machines then you do production control which will be industrial engineering kind of stuff industrial engineering also totally comes under manufacturing routing scheduling production making uh, and then quality assurance maintenance inspection everything is part of manufacturing then shipping then customer service and the final disposal this entire cycle actually comes under the concept of manufacturing but we will talk about only unit processes in this course just to let you know because manufacturing is very big but then the 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 course goals are only to talk about uh, key processes so we'll talk about uh, uh, basically some of the things like if i want to reduce weight things things to process things things is not easy right if i want to make cans if you let, let me just go sh show how cans were made from say 60s to 1990s right this is in uh, 2009 10 uh, this is how the can looks right here and this is how can looked in 1955 we are able to i think this is in 90s but i think it's even less now you have you have saved more this, from from 18.8 grams you went to 13.5 grams now i think it will be 10 to 12 grams so over the years you start to make thinner and thinner cans just by the process improvement just just by understanding the process better how we can deform and this is significant cost saving for the companies right so this is what i wanted to say that the, this innovation what it has done is it has enabled us to make lighter cans which was which is not possible with the technology uh, in 50s and then if we talk about i want something very high tolerance What do you mean by tolerance? How many people understand what tolerance means? So, uh, deviation from prescribed value. So, tolerance is not uh, deviation from de uh, de described value. But tolerance basically means that um, you are right in some sort of allowable, allowable uh, deviation from a desired value. That's what tolerance would be. So, say if I uh, ask somebody to make 50 mm shaft. right you will say it's very easy to make a shaft i can take a shaft i can take a bar stock and turn it on a lathe right very easy to do if somebody says that you make 50 mm plus minus 1 mm shaft very easy if somebody tells that you make 50 mm plus minus 0.010 or 10 micron tolerance tell me between this a and this b what will be the cost difference they are making the same thing they are making the same diameter product in one i say that you have 1 mm tolerance and in another one i say that you have 10 microns tolerance what do you think will be the difference anybody probably close to 100 times No, no. I'm just saying that would there be a cost difference between the two? If somebody tells you make a 50 mm bar, uh, 50 mm shaft. 
one guy says 50 mm plus minus 1 mm is okay for me the other guy says no no i want 50 mm plus minus 10 microns would we use the same process to make both of them no sir like precision is not uh, not accurate as in b so yeah. we required a high so, so, so 50 mm plus one another i can take any crappy lathe and do this but if somebody tells me 10 micron accuracy i want i cannot use uh, a normal lathe machine either i have to use a precision lathe machine or i have to go to a centerless grinding which is very very expensive so depending upon what is the tolerance my process changes and the cost goes significantly the a will a will cost you probably manufacturing cost will be 10 rupees b will be 200 rupees 20 times more just i'm giving you some 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 uh, uh, some numbers to work with these are not literary numbers but i'm just giving you that there will be orders of magnitude higher cost just by the tolerances i want to understand and appreciate that okay and then basically you i have talked about this mostly that uh, manufacturing process basically means there will be some input mass input shape you provide some energy and you get some output shape and output mass right so there can be mass conserving processes like casting bulk deformation and powder processing mass reducing which is machining mass adding which is joining so these two will be covered in this course okay so this you all uh, will will study more and more as we go next class we'll do casting so this is summary and then what i will do is a uh, 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 basically i'll show you a uh, machine which you have built this this is relevant machine because this is uh, a machine which uh, would wait wait i think this is i'm not able to play this yeah so this is a machine which you have built on our lab Okay. For some reason, it was not playing there, so I'll 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 have to play like this. So this is a additive manufacturing machine which has been designed and built in the lab. Yeah. So this is a a complete automated machine. with a powder delivery system which will do 3d printing on a robot <clears throat> this has been totally built by the students here and uh, one of the students who has built is your one is one of your tas actually so you'll be interacting with him he has single handedly designed the entire system built it and we're using this system for uh, hard facing of molds repair of those free form repair of the molds you can scan the defects and and basically redeposit the material locally so this is something uh, which we have made on the machine um the reason why it's a big deal is the strength of this material is is roughly 1.6 gpa harder than any material you know so machining will be a nightmare of this kind of a material then we have made another machine which i'll just show you here before we end the class this is a vent cleaning machine this we built for ca tires so when they do this vent cleaning they will use a uh, basically a small drill to do, do it so this was drill used drill used to break and it can go into the tire the tire can blast it's very dangerous uh, they actually lost some th tens of thousands of tires order with reno because there was one tire which has metal filling in it so we designed a machine which could automatically identify the the vents and fire a laser nanosecond pulse laser using a robot so this machine we designed built in house again sachin was involved in this and we went ahead and we we installed this machine in ciet uh, factory So these are state officials. We trained them in our lab, and then finally we went ahead and uh, installed the machine. So basically, I'm giving you an idea because uh, to the end, to end the introduction class is this is the level of work which a student has done. This 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 uh, machine was designed by a DD student uh, who's who designed the machine, who developed the entire thing, electrical systems integration, uh, all the controls integration, 
uh, even the automation of detecting the holes, everything was done by that student and and uh, and Sachin, who, who who would be there, who would be a TA. So this 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 entire work has been done by students, just to give you an idea that what kind of work the students are capable of doing. Okay, so with this, I will stop here. I, I I'm sorry I took some few minutes over. So thank you so much for your uh, time, and we'll meet in the next class on Monday. Okay, bye bye.